Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Are you confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, and a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth? Are you confident, Paul asks in Romans? Are you sure that you are a light to the blind? When Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, or you are the light of the world, do you really believe that you are the light? The law, in which you boast, is the light to the blind, which you yourself do not heed. You who boast in the law, through your breaking of the law, do you dishonor God? Indeed, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. So be careful when you boast, for truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, not one iota or stroke, shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 15 to 18. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 247 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Last week, Richard, we stopped off right in the middle of the pericope about salt and light. And it's providential because this gives us the opportunity to demonstrate a point that you were emphasizing last week, which is the importance of continuity. We typically take this as the parable of salt and light, followed by the admonition about the law and the prophets, in the same way that we separate the Beatitudes from the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And that's an incorrect approach to the text. This is, as we said repeatedly, one lengthy teaching by the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Last time we talked about how the saltiness is demonstrated by the suffering that the believer goes through, the natural result of embracing and trusting in this word. That's what makes the believer useful. This really is the usefulness of salt being salty and light being light and being bright and being able to see with it. You know, there's always this emphasis that it's not just enough to have. Jesus can say, I'm the light of the world, but it's not something that we as hearers of the message that Jesus brings to us can say. We can possess the light insofar as we not only hear the teaching, but live it out in such a way that the evidence is clear based on the suffering and based on the persecution that comes at the end of the Beatitudes. So it all fits together as a single argument. Richard, we wrapped up with verse 14 last week, but upon listening to our conversation with Father Paul this Tuesday, it's interesting to think about the metaphor once again of the city and of the light. Because as Father Paul explained in the Greek epics, in ancient Greece, you have cities competing with one another, often violently, and the Greek epics being a call to unity but a kind of unity that still sets the unified cities, for example, of Athens and Sparta, against others. But here, Christ, in verse 14, as we said last week, is talking about a city to which this light is carried. Again, we have to think of ourselves not as the light when he says, you are the light of the world. The Apostle Paul makes fun of this in his letter to the Romans. We have to think of our duty as carriers of the light. That's how we are a light to the world. In the same way, a child who reads the epistle in church is the voice of God to the assembly. The child 
itself is not the voice of God, obviously. So here in verse 14, a city is set on a hill in a visible place. It's a beacon because you bring the light of God's instruction to the city, and it's a city to which all are called. It's consistent with the idea of Christ being seated in authority on the Mount Zion to give the Torah to the Gentiles, to gather all of the nations, the Goyim, as one people united by the teaching. So the city set on a hill is, again, it's a beautiful anti-geographic metaphor. He's definitely not talking about Jerusalem when he's talking about the heavenly Zion, the city set on the heavenly hill, so to speak. This is precisely from Isaiah 2. Many people shall go and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. It talks about Zion. The word of the Lord comes from Jerusalem. And then finally, at the end of that passage in Isaiah 2, verse 5, O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And it's clearly in this context of the city on the Mount of Zion. So it's eschatological that the light is going to shine forth, but it's not going to be a physical light. And I don't want people to get mystical on me. It's not a light that emanates from people's eyes or something like this. It's not the light of Mount Olympus. It's not the Olympic light. That's, I think, a way of saying it, Rich. Exactly. Exactly. What the light is, is a light of the teaching. I mean, in the minor prophets, when the nations want to come to the city of the Lord, it's because people are doing Torah there. They're acting according to the teaching. That's why the nations want to come there. You know, in the United States, we always talk about the city on the hill. The city on the hill in the United States is one whose light is capitalism, money, greed, and people from all over the world want to come to our country in order to enjoy money because they can have lots of opportunities. It is not the teaching of Torah. It is not the teaching that Jesus is presenting that fills the true city of the Lord from which his teaching emanates. And it's the Lord's teaching, and it's the teaching we just had at the beginning of chapter 5. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 15 consolidates what I've been saying about both the salt and the light, that it's something that's put in you. Again, we mentioned last week this beautiful hymn from Theophany, where the poet, the ecclesial poet, asks the question, how can the lamp illumine the light? This is the discourse between Christ and John the Baptist in the hymnography. The lamp doesn't give the light. The city doesn't give the light. The light is put in it. And once that lamp is lit, why would you hide it? Why would you not put it up on a lampstand so it can give light to all who are in the house? But if this is the biblical house that is created in the letters of Paul, if this is truly the church of God, the heavenly city, it's a house that is open to all the nations. It's a house that's open to create fellowship. It's the house under the headship of the one God of Scripture, who is the God of all the nations. So you see how insidious it is when we teach little children that what Jesus is saying is they should discover who they are and share it with everybody. It's not that people aren't interesting and valuable in their own right, Richard. That's not what we're saying. But when you talk that way, you're working against what Jesus is saying because the belief in your own special, unique value and your identity and your community's identity undermines what this specific light, which is put into the lamp, which is to be set on the lampstand, was given to achieve which is light for everyone in the house. Your light, as the one who trusts in this word, is not a light that you are born with. It's the light that you learned from this instruction. This is the only light that has value. This is the only word that has value. You know, you've said many times, Father, that the problem is when individuals, individual humans, start speaking because their word is not valid set alongside the word of God. It's a human word. It's a finite word. It's an egotistical word. It's not the word that Jesus came to bring. And so the only word that's valid is God's word. And so the only light 
that makes any difference is the one that comes from that same word. The point is that when Richard or I stand up to preach or to teach, I have to say what the reading said. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And here, of course, when we talk about seeing the good works, we are talking about seeing the Ergon that was put in you, the way in which you were energized, as St. Paul says, energized by the light of the instruction that puts the work in you. It's the same theme over and over again. The point is not that they see your works. The point is that they glorify God. That's the point. When God brought the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, the point was that the Egyptians might see the power of God. The point was not the liberation of the sons of Israel. The point was the glorification of God. The lampstand is not useful unless it's got a light on it. Other than that, it's just another piece of furniture that you can't do anything with. But when you put the light on it, then it's useful. And as it says here, it can show all those in the house the light that they need. It's not enough to simply have the light. And it's not even enough to act according to the light. The ultimate test of whether this light shining from you is, in fact, the light of the Lord's teaching is whether those who see it are able then to glorify your Father. It's interesting. It doesn't say God. It says glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So Jesus is very specific. He doesn't say God. He says your Father. And he doesn't say your Father, lest you be confused. Your Father, which is in heaven. It points directly to God, the source of this teaching. And that's where the light is supposed to guide people. Look, you can't understand verse 16 unless you go back once again and read verse 9 and verse 11 of the Beatitudes in the same chapter. Because in verse 9, we are told, blessed are the peacemakers. And we explain that the way a father establishes peace in his household in this setting is by giving instruction. He sits at the table and he gives instruction, and everyone gathered at the table is put in good order. It says when a father comes and sits at the table and the children stop squabbling. That's the point. That's what is meant by shalom in a scriptural setting. But it's a specific shalom. It's a shalom that is wrought by the instruction, by the light that is shared with all those gathered. But then in verse 11, it talks about, again, insults and persecution. But that's how God is glorified. So when you come back then to verse 16, what Jesus is saying is, look, you have to manifest this teaching that I put in you. You have to do this work that I put in you. I'm energizing you with the light of instruction. When you are energized by the light of instruction, it will lead to your persecution, and that will glorify your Father because you'll be bearing witness to him. Oh, and by the way, we will know whether or not he's your Father by the way that you act. Are you one of the children who sat at his table with me? How do you know if someone is your son or daughter? By how they behave. It has nothing to do with biology. That's why Galatians is such a beautiful letter, because anyone can become adopted. That's the point. And this mechanism of adoption is endemic to Roman culture. It's actually very useful and very important. The emphasis on biology is silly. Anyone who's been adopted who has a relationship with their adopted mother or their adopted father, knows that their biological parent is a myth. The parent is the one who reared you. The emphasis on trying to find out where you got your brown eyes is vain talk. It's a vain emphasis. Who cares what color your eyes are? Let's see how you act. Who put your behavior in you, the one who reared you? So there's a connection between seeing the good works and not just glorifying the father, but glorifying the Father because you are recognized as his children so that when you are insulted and persecuted, people know which tribe is being attacked. It's the tribe constituted by the Father of Jesus. And I'm so glad that you said verse 16. We can't understand 16 without verse 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So the good works that you do You don't get any more credit for them than the prophets did in their day. 
I don't know, Father, we've been taking a tally of what the most un-American verses are in this gospel, but this has got to take the cake because you are not allowed to take credit for what you've done. Not only will you be ignored, and not only will people overlook you and not give you credit, you should not receive credit. You don't deserve credit. You rejoice when you're persecuted for doing the right thing. Christians want to boycott Target because they don't say Merry Christmas, because they're being persecuted. Really? First of all, I don't know how that counts as persecution. Secondly, I don't know what happened to verse 12 where you're supposed to rejoice when you're being persecuted. We've been saying all along that this light is the light of instruction. When Jesus gives blessings in the Beatitudes, he is blessing you with the instruction, which is translated in Hebrew as Torah. The word Torah is very versatile. It means law, but it also means instruction. And we keep saying that that's what Christ is talking about, and all of that is consolidated by the following verse. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. In other words, I'm blessing you with this instruction. I am telling you that you can fulfill this instruction by being persecuted. I am saying that this instruction gives you flavor, and this instruction makes you useful to provide light for others so that they can walk along the same path without stumbling. So let's be clear. I didn't come to erase this light. I didn't come to nullify the flavor of this salt. I came to fulfill it. Jesus is coming so that this light and this salt is spread to the nations. We spent so much time in the first four chapters talking about kings and talking about movement and how Jesus specifically rejected the reign of the kings. Jesus is undermining at every point the line of the kings in chapter one in being born outside of the city of the king in chapter two, the wise men from the east ignoring the king in Jerusalem. Constantly there's this undermining of kingship and an undermining of the centers of power. Jesus came because he is that light. Jesus is this teaching. Jesus is bringing the teaching. As he comes, the teaching comes. I don't want people to be confused that Jesus and the teaching are exactly the same thing. That's not what I'm saying. But for those who are listening, Jesus is the teaching. Jesus is the teaching insofar as when he opens his mouth, that's what comes out. And so when he comes, he comes to fulfill it, which means to make it whole. And to make it whole means that it has to go to everybody. And this is why he spends his time in the wilderness. And he spends his time in the small towns. And he spends his time outside the centers of power. Jesus is also a bearer of this light. And he himself has to be salty. And he has to light the house with this light. And he himself is going to have to rejoice when he himself is persecuted. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. I am uncomfortable, of course, with this translation, Richard. I prefer the original Greek, in which Matthew explains that not one iota, not one iota or Kerea. The reason it's important is because, as Father Paul has been explaining for the past year on our Tuesday show, it's all about whether it's an iota or whichever letter of the Greek alphabet is written, because we are at the end of the day when we're talking about the light of instruction, we are talking about grammar and vocabulary and syntax and context. So it's really a shame that they tried to smooth over the translation by saying the smallest letter. He said iota, and we should stick with iota. Of course, the stress is that every single mark on the page will be accounted for until it has been fulfilled, until someone has acted in such a way that not one grammatical mark, not one inscription, not one letter on the page has been left behind. Everything has to be fulfilled. And the implication, of course, is that Christ is the one who does this in the crucifixion.
Jesus' point is this fulfillment. I mean, we have fulfillment mentioned twice in two verses. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill, and not one jot or one tittle, one yota or kerea will be changed until everything is fulfilled. This goes back to what we were saying before about the peacemakers, because we have to understand that this completion that Jesus talks about and the peace that is mentioned in the Beatitudes both come from the same root in Hebrew, which is shalom, a completeness, a wholeness. Jesus is imploring his audience to take in this teaching so that they can be inheritors of the kingdom, but that they will suffer. And as a result, they cannot flag in their strength. They have to continue to be salty and bright in what they teach. And the teaching that they teach can only come from the teaching that Jesus taught them. They're not allowed to pitch in and add their own idea to it. This is what Jesus is trying to fulfill. He's trying to make this complete so that all human beings have access to this teaching, not just limited to the sons of Israel, but to everyone, so that everyone can enjoy the saltiness and enjoy the light. And in this way, the law must stay complete as it's always been. He's not changing it for the Gentiles. He's passing it along to the Gentiles in the precise form it's always been in since Moses and the prophets. And again, just reflecting, Rich, on Father Paul's Tuesday show, where he talks about monotheism as being ominous because suddenly, instead of pitting everything as this God against that God or my God against your God, everyone is stuck with one God who sometimes is against them and sometimes comes to their aid. I think. That concept ties in very well with this emphasis on the iota and the kerea, because it's easy when you're reading scripture to say, I like this part, I don't like this part, or this part applies to me, and this part applies to my enemies. But by emphasizing that every last letter, every last grammatical tick, every last inscription applies, all you're left with is crucifixion. You're left with no option, because if it's applied, as Paul explains with respect to Deuteronomy, we're all under a sentence of death, because none of us can do what it requires on the one hand, and on the other hand, stepping outside the character of the regulations contained within the Torah, the Torah is also a story about a God who very often turns against you and shows you the face of your enemies as his will for you. All of that has to be accomplished. That's what's going to happen in this story. That's the yoke that Jesus is carrying for the sake of his flock. And at the same time, inviting all of us to carry for the sake of the needy neighbor. I'm tired these days of hearing Christians complaining about society today and the laws of this nation going on and on about the importance of religious freedom. The beauty of the gospel is that it does not depend on this party or that party or this king or that king to be religiously free. What it depends on is you doing the right thing. You must sacrifice your independence, sacrifice your freedom, so that you are completely beholden to this law which is unchanging. Jesus himself cannot change this teaching. Do not campaign for religious freedom. Give over your religious freedom and act according to the will of God. And if you are persecuted, if someone wants to take away your religious freedom, so to speak, they're not taking away your religious freedom. They're taking away the suffering that goes along with your practicing your religious freedom. And you're supposed to suffer if you're acting according to this teaching. Don't vote according to how you can suffer the least and practice your religion. That is not what. Jesus is talking about in the Bible, which you're professing. You've contradicted yourself. Embrace the suffering, just like the prophets, because you're practicing this teaching that Jesus offers, and help the needy neighbor, the one upon whom you can practice this very teaching. Practice your teaching so that others are helped out, so that others might enjoy a reprieve from suffering but only in a way that you do not flag from your suffering and that your God, your Father who is in heaven, continues to be glorified. When you complain about others, 
persecuting you, you forfeit the blessing of Jesus Christ. But more importantly, you neglect your duty under the authority of the gospel, not to complain about others, but to complain about yourself, to look at the ways in which you are causing suffering for others. Because when you push back and try to defend your community or defend your religious identity or your religious freedoms, you are doing so at someone else's expense. The writers of Scripture emasculated and disempowered Caesar in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. The minute you complain about Caesar, instead of letting him crucify you, the minute you complain, you yourself become his son and forfeit your place at the Father's table. To him alone be the glory, the dominion, and the majesty. Thanks very much, Dr. Brenton. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.